I look at it, the radio, you can think of the radio technology that's existed up till now, starting in just before 1900. You can think of it as, it's almost like the age of dinosaurs. There's three living types and there's three extinct types. And you can further classify them into the radios that didn't use amplifiers and the radios that did. So the first, and was the, with the, which was also the origin of radio, was spark. and started with the discovery that uh, electricity could be sent by the speed of light methods uh, from one piece of metal to another in 1886. And it became extinct because it was replaced by a much better system in, uh, uh, just before the 1920s. And by the mid-1920s, it was illegal everywhere because... Uh, basically, you're playing with lightning, and it had just as much interference as lightning does. Uh, another of the early ones in which there was no amplifiers involved, either with the transmitter or the receiver, was the RF alternator. Uh, the Alexanderson al alternator developed at uh, General Electric was the, the most famous example. There's one, of, there's one uh, alternator still running. This produced a, a good clean sine wave, which Spark did not. Spark produced what were called damped waves. The alternator uh, produced a beautiful wave, but the problem was that when you're trying to make radio frequency signals with a mechanical device, this is an alternator like you have in your car. Well, it didn't look the same, but it's the same principle. Um, that uh, getting megahertz frequencies with a uh, thing made of steel and copper is, is it's basically beyond our ability today. So they worked great, but they had a frequency range of about 15 kilohertz to, I think the, the highest frequency one was 24. There's one left, it's in Grimmiton, Sweden, and they run it once a year. I think it was just about a month ago. Okay, so this, I'm sorry, this was my first slide, and I just said that the three things we'll look at is how the radio worked, the effect of the radio on the disaster, and the effect of the disaster on the radio. And this, the, the, here's, the, here's the species. And uh, so what we'll be looking at is um, the development of the uh, original spark transmitters, which were um, in the 1890s. And the RF alternator was one of the ancient types of radio which um, didn't use amplifiers. It used a mechanical RF alternator. And as I say, there's one left now in Bremerton, Sweden. The Polson Arc had an amplifier and if you look at the picture, it's just one down in the lower right corner. And they were also enormous. In the middle is an Alexanderson alternator. And you can tell its size by, you see the four brass gauges. That's, that's the look to see how it was running. So uh, this didn't come with a belt clip. And uh, the Federal Arc here, what it actually was, was a uh, Danish physicist, Poulsen, invented this uh, back at the beginning of the century. And it, uh, it runs on the fourth state of matter, plasma. And so what this thing is, is an enormous electromagnet. And between the two poles is this container up here, and it's full of plasma. And it turns out that plasma, and, and it's the plasma is in an arc, a continuous spark of RF. And as the voltage across the plasma goes down, the current goes up. And if you think about that for a moment, that's precisely the opposite of what, say, voltage across a resistor does. And it's actually amplification, negative, negative resistance, they used to call it. And so this thing, it worked and it could get up into the megahertz range, but it used an enormous amount of energy. And I mean, this is just the oscillator here, and you see the size of the fella beside it. So um, it had its drawbacks too. And then the three others that we all know, vacuum tubes, semiconductors, and software-defined radios. And all these used amplifiers. So if you think about it, not having any kind of amplifier uh, presented severe challenges to spark technology. Okay, here's the, uh, the Titanic. And uh, you can see here's its antenna. Just to give you some dimensions of this ship, uh, its weight displacement, they usually say, 53,000 tons, 883 feet long, but under 1,000 feet long, 92 foot beam across, and 46,000 horsepower. Interestingly enough, it had two of the standard propulsion of the time, what they called triple expansion steam engines, but it had a turbine. The middle, um, the center prop, it had three screws. The center screw had a uh, uh, Parsons uh, steam turbine. So 
this, and it had everything electric that existed in those days. It was supposed to be the most modern ship. And it carried as it left um, uh, Southampton 2,224 and 2, people and two radios. Now this is the antenna that the Marconi used. You can see in the picture here, if I just go back, it's uh, what it is, it, it, they called it a twin T antenna. And the two masts are 800, and, uh, excuse me, 600 and some feet apart. And, uh, but the antenna itself was just 450 feet long. Whoops, sorry. And this is the way it uh, looked. It, uh, it had spreaders, the two masts are at the aft and the, the fore. It had 20 foot ash spreaders. And there was four identical T antennas. This little thing here, the, the, this part is just uh, hemp, a uh, tarred rat line, they called it. Um, here's insulators on one end of the T's and here are the insulators on the other. So that they were each 450 feet. So the, these are horizontal parallel to the water and four lead-ins. And they all went to the same feed through on the ceiling, on the roof of the, uh, the radio shack. If you add up all the wire that the Titanic had in its antenna, it's about a half a mile, 2,560 feet of wi uh, wire. And if you can imagine, the, uh, the T was 250 feet above the water, the four Ts, and it was 190 feet down to the feed in to the uh, transmitter receiver. So this was one impressive antenna. And of course, it's sitting in an enormous disk of salt water, horizon to horizon. Uh, so uh, this thing had a uh, uh, tremendous ability to, to collect RF, which you needed since you had no amplifiers in your receiver. Um, the feet is an exact center of the T. Um, some people have tried to say that the T's, the tops, were merely capacity hats over four verticals, but I don't think that really describes it properly because they found, the operators found, that it had quite a lot of gain along the long axis. And they could tell this because as the ship turned, they could be listening to a station and they could watch the gain go up and down. And they found that the most effective uh, axes to transmit messages on was uh, back or four, which was perfect because if they left England, they could keep, keep communicating for quite a long time. And as they approached North America, they could keep uh, communicating because of course the, the antenna was lined up with, with uh, the boat. Okay, uh, quick. Now, is part of this covered up by the little pictures? Probably is. Uh, no, it, it looks complete. Oh, okay, great. That's, that's all I want to know. This is the basic spark <laughs> transmitter, uh, which if you were a ham in 1905 or 1903, this is what you'd have. And uh, it's um, what's out of this, this is a buzzer here, or a, a high voltage inductor, as they would call it. and this part, there's a battery that's covered, and then as you can see, there's a, there's a key at the bottom, and that, that's it, that's all the circuit there is. And uh, you depress the key, you, uh, voltage runs through this uh, from the battery, and the, the uh, core acts as a solenoid, pulls up this little button, and the circuit opens, uh, the solenoid uh, field collapses, the bu button closes again, and a high induced voltage is put into the secondary. This is really very much like a spark coil or a house buzzer or the Model T spark coil. So you have your circuit over here. This is just an old uh, uh, version of the capacitor schematic. Uh, and here's of course an inductor. You adjust this for resonance. As long as a spark is jumping across the gap there, you'll be generating RF and this will be transferred into your antenna, which hopefully is more or less uh, resonant on your desired frequency. And uh, a kid starting off in those days would have something like this, an old car battery, Model T Fords, uh, I think Henry made 15 million of them, and each one had four spark coils, one for each uh, cylinder. So there's about 60 million of these floating around the U.S. at one time or another. You'd use your, your Model T spark coil, make a capacitor out of sheets of glass and zinc, have your spark gap, and you could uh, vary your coupling with something like this on, on your, your out, output of your tank. And with a Model T, you could get to the end of your block or maybe to the next block. And that was, uh, uh, this is known as a plain spark transmitter. And if you were to look at what it was putting out, it would look like this. Uh, it's called a damp spark. 
uh, of course, because uh, after the spark extinguishes, um, well, actually, as the, the, it gets weaker and weaker, the amplitude follows and when the spark extinguishes, you have dead air. So when you're key down, there's an awful lot of dead air there, unlike today, where, of course, this is a, what we get out of a modern radio. This um, uh, some enterprising folks uh, made up uh, a functional replica of the transmitter on the Titanic, and it, it had what was called a synchronous rotary spark. I'll describe, explain that in a moment. And that gave something that looked like this. And uh, where most signals were, were harsh and raspy and had a, a, a hum, uh, this was known as a, a, the musical spark. And when the Titanic left, um, an operator in any other ship would know that the either, when he heard that musical tone, he would know that either he was listening to the Titanic or to the Olympic the Titanic sister ship, which had been launched the year before, because they were the only ones in the air that sounded like that. Actually, back in this day, um, there was dozens of different transmitter designs and they all sounded different. So if you were uh, a, uh, an experienced operator, you could, you could tell a great deal just by the sound of the, of the signal. Okay, this is what um, uh, something running on 60 Hertz would look like a transmitter of the time. Imagine trying to copy this to get the noise background that you'd get on 600 meters, 500 kilohertz. You increase the frequency, it gets better and better, and you go up to 750 hertz, and you've got something that's not too far from a modern signal. So they realized early on that the old buzzers would be in the 60 to 120 kilohertz range, but if they could get some way to increase the frequency of sparks, they would, could fill in the gaps down here and get something closer to true continuous wave. And there was a big improvement in how easy this was to copy compared to these, these nasty signals. So what they did was uh, they came up with uh, what they called a rotary spark gap. So they, they fed, uh, they used an alternator and the Morse key just uh, turned off and on the AC to a step up transformer. And this might go from 100 volts to 3,000 or 5,000 or whatever you could manage. And uh, they would then have a, a second motor with a little uh, rotary spark gap on it and it would spin around. And whenever the studs on the, the disc lined up with these two uh, uh, studs from the circuit, you'd get a spark. And so you get a high frequency of sparks and here's your, your tank circuit here and here's your, your antenna. So. One of the problems they found almost early is yes, they got more sparks, but the problem was that the, um, you'd only get a really good spark if your AC, of course, was on either the positive peak or the negative peak. If these happened to line up when you were, say, in the middle, you'd get no spark at all or, or, or some way up the side of one of the sine waves, you'd get a weak spark. So um, these uh, were around for a number of years and then somebody and, you know, we really need to synchronize the spark gap with the cycles on the AC, just like the old business in World War I where they, they started trying to shoot to the propeller with a machine gun and found it was rough on the propeller. So they came up with a synchronizing mechanism. This is, uh, this is a, a part of that modern replica of the um, uh, Titanic's uh, radio system or the transmitter. And this, this is what the, the, they call the disk discharger. And so you see here, you'd have the high voltage between these two sets of contacts and you have a motor spinning rapidly, pairs of contacts. And so you had to have a pair lining up and that would allow a spark to be produced. And you notice the difference here that as in the original, they made the tips tungsten because what you really had here was an arc welder, but you didn't want to do any welding. You wanted to just to generate the sparks. Okay, so the system uh, was the state of the art in 1912 and was inter interesting enough, usually Marconi sent out a field engineer, but I've read in two places now that it was actually, this one was installed, aligned, tested, and then operated by the, the radio operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, the two fellows who accompanied the, uh, uh, and, and, and operated the radio for its entire life. And this was at Harland and Wolf, which was the shipyard in Belfast, Ireland, where the Titanic was built. And so everything was full, fully functional in 1912. So the Titanic had the call MGY. I should say that Marconi had a monopoly uh, on radios, out of, at least out of Great Britain at the time. So all 
Marconi radios uh, started with M, or all, all the stations on the ships and on shore. Uh, and the, the Titanic ran on 100 volts, actually it ran on 200 volts DC, plus and minus 100 from ship ground, which was quite, it was, it was clever because it meant that you could run the big motors and the stoves and, and whatnot, and the elevators on um, uh, quite a lot of power, but no voltage over 100 volts, so it wasn't too dangerous. The transmitter was what we could call a dual bander. The normal wavelength was uh, 600 <coughs> meters. They, of course, used meters in those days, 500 kilohertz to us today. And 300 to 325 meters was short wave, and this, this was up at uh, a little over 900 kilohertz. I had that musical 840 hertz modulated carrier. Marconi guaranteed it for 250 miles during the day and said it should go 1,000 miles at night, but they didn't guarantee that. So the receiver, and we'll, we'll have a look at these things. I'm, I'm going to go into the gear in some detail, at least because it interested me. Uh, the, something called the multi-tuner, which was for a really excellent way to select a narrow band of frequencies out of the spectrum, uh, which most other radios didn't have, uh, and something called the Marconi magnetic detector, or the MAGI, and they had a choice. They also had a Fleming valve tuner, uh, for the detector. It was either one or the other. And you may re remember that Ambrose Fleming invented the diode, and this was his invention that they were trying out. Emergency was um, rated and transmitted was a one and a half kilowatt plain spark, just using a big, a 10 inch. They used to measure the, not by the voltage, but the length of the coil. The longer the coil, the more voltage. And there's a charger and batteries that, this is a much inferior system, but it had the big advantage that if the, the ship power failed, which you could well do in an emergency, uh, that there was a big, uh, big bank of batteries so that this plain spark coil would, would work. But your guaranteed range went from 250 miles to 40 miles on the same antenna. So that tells you something about how efficient they are. And auxiliary receiver was a nasty thing from about 1903. Uh, it was reliable, but it had no tuning at all. You, I don't know how, if you got 40 miles of that, you're having a good day. Uh, now, I wanted to find a single schematic that would show everything in the radio, but that wasn't possible. Uh, you had to, the, the one doesn't exist, and there isn't one that shows everything without any mistakes. So anyway, uh, here we go. The, uh, the way it's, it, it has what they call, the, we would call an MG set, or they called an MG set, uh, through the 40s and the 50s. A motor generator set. So you start as your motor, and I'm going to say a little bit about this control because it, it's, it's kind of unique and very clever that uh, you have a big knife, big knife switch at the beginning here, throw the power. It's, of course, supposed to go to the, the drive motor, which runs the alternator, which produces the voltage, which is uh, uh, converted into RF. But uh, if you just uh, had this wire running right to the motor, uh, a stopped DC motor, the type they were using then, uh, would be a dead short, that the, the commutator isn't moving, the windings on the armature are just an ohm or two, so uh, you'd burn out the motor. So what they did, is they came up with this control, and this lever is something that the operator would grab with his hand, he'd push it to the right, and this is a, uh, a big power resistor here. So as soon as he hit the resistor, if you follow the wires, you just got a trickle of current into the motor. So the armature would start moving slowly and it would speed up. As you pushed it over, more and more current would go in until it was full speed over here. Now, the interesting thing was that if you let go of it in here, it had a spring in it, so it would drop back to here and everything would shut off. And it got all the way over and there was full current. This is an electromagnet and there was a little piece of steel on the side of the lever which you pushed and it would grip this. Now, what that did was, uh, it would stick over there as long as power was flowing and you'd operate your radio. But if there's a failure down in the engine room or somebody was switching from one generator to another, the pause would cause it to flip back here because if it stayed there, when the power came back in the engine room, you'd have full power on the stationary motor and you might burn, good chance you'd burn it out. So uh, anyway, and this turned out to be vital towards the end because uh, uh, the engine room was failing as it filled with seawater, and so uh, Jack Phillips at the key had to reset that several times, but it just a swipe of your hand and you had it over there. 
So it, it, it gave him a little more time. If it, if it hadn't been there, he probably would have burned out the motor the first time the power failed. The field winding here just uh, uh, adjusts the amount of power that, that is, uh, the engine can put out. The motor had a max power of about 10 horsepower. And I can't see the alternator over here, so you'll have to forgive me if, if uh, uh, I, I don't describe it exactly. But anyway, you see that line shows a strong mechanical connection. So once the motor is spinning, you start up the alternator with the other knife switch and adjust it with the field. And the output goes down into what's called the primary circuit of the high voltage transformer. And they had this resonance coil, and it took me a while to figure out what this was doing. But uh, the thing is running at um, th uh, 6,300 RPM, the motor generator uh, combination. And it, it's, uh, it's an eight pole alternator with a 16 stud discharger down here, which we'll get to. Anyway, you do all the arithmetic and it, it gives you an 840 hertz musical note on the uh, RF that goes out of the antenna. You key this down and, you, and if you key this directly, you're keying somewhere between 17 and 20 amps at 300 volts AC. So um, if you were there and, you're, and the ship was rolling a bit and you wouldn't put, want to put your hand down to steady yourself on the back of the key. And in fact, this isn't what they, they finally use. They put in what they call the magnetic key relay, which we just call a relay here. So all the key was opening and closing was the solenoid current to a, a heavy relay, which went in here. This takes the 300 volts, um, bumps it up to 10 to 14,000 volts DC at half an ampere. Um, a real electric chair, if you make a mistake. Choke coils to keep, let the DC through, keep the uh, RF on this side. And now we're going to go over into the, uh, the uh, rest of it. Okay, this is, this is what the uh, motor generator set looked like. And uh, uh, the motor here, the generator, and the disc discharger here. And uh, you see how the front of the alternator is open like this. Well, the reason for that was that uh, you could reach in here and with that little handle, you could move the brushes back and forth. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, that's how you synchronized the position of the alternator, the peak of the uh, voltage cycle, with one of the sets of studs moving by here. So this is how you've got your synchronous rotary spark. You set it up there. And you could do this by just watching the spark. And there's one of these things that runs at the Antique Wireless Museum in, in just outside Rochester, New York. And I, I've been there and I've watched it work. And it's, it's pretty, it's easy. You, you pull on that little uh, commutator, uh, the brush, excuse me, and uh, the spark brightens up and gets louder, and, and it is loud. It, it's uh, like a continuous lightning uh, crash. And uh, so the room they put it in was called the silent room, which is exactly what it wasn't, but they lined it with heavy wood, and they put this, uh, this is another wooden box. Doesn't show it here, but it, this was lined with lead and asbestos, because otherwise you'd burn up the box immediately from the heat and the, of, the, of the spark. But uh, so this is where they got the synchrony. So they got the optimal uh, energy out of the, uh, uh, the alternator and the disc discharger. This is, this is a, a CGI computer graphics image, uh, but there's no doubt that it's correct. It's just a lot nicer than most of the photographs that, that exist from the time. Okay, so here's the rest of the device. Now this is one of the things that was missing in the first one, that each, the, the motor and the generator each had a voltage and a, an amp set up here. So you could watch exactly what they were doing and you would, uh, a lot of this stuff, when, they, when, when Phillips and Bride, the operator set it up in, in Northern Ireland, they would make notes of where the, the, the settings were. So when you booted it up with, uh, later, you'd go to a lot of presets. You wouldn't have to figure out everything again. Here's the motor generator set. And you can see the line through the middle goes to the disc discharger over here. And so what you get is, um, this is the tank circuit here. These, these big square things, they're large steel tubs filled with sheets of zinc alternating with sheets of uh, glass. And uh, if you, and there's a thing on the top, which is a series of sliding copper bars with, with copper pegs that went in. And in one position, they were all in parallel, and that was good for 500 kilohertz, 600 meters. Or you could slide the bar, it, it was like a big band switch, and it would slide over to the uh, 325 meter or the 900 kilohertz position. 
And this gadget down here, this was the spiral inductor. And there was a big knob on top and it was made of very heavy coil of copper wire and you'd wind that in and out. So between switching the right capacitors in and winding the spiral inductor, you tuned it to either 500 kilohertz or 900, 930. And uh, this, this discharger down here, coordinated with the motor and the alternator, would, when the peaks came up on that uh, 10 to 14,000 volts, then you'd get a, a spark across there and that would uh, start the RF circulating in the uh, uh, tank circuit here. Above the tank circuit is something they called a jigger. I don't know where that came from. And this uh, had two coils. You see how it's sort of on a sled. It looks like the bottom can be slid up on the sled. Well, that's what, just what you did. Underneath, not shown, there's a little crank and you could screw up the, the front, the face that you see there. And that had the part of the coil which uh, fed the uh, antenna loading coils over here. And the part in the back was coupled in here. So it was basically varying coupling and uh, varying the coupling between a PA tank and, and the antenna circuit was something that was kept on for many years. If any of you are interested in old World War II stuff like the command sets that all the aircraft carried, they all had varying coupling because that's just the way it was done. The, the, Pi, the Pi tank really came out in the 50s and later. Um, okay, let's see a couple of other things here. Some of it's, a lot of it's hidden in there. It's a little hard, so I have to try to remember. This uh, these are called earth arresters, and they're a very clever device that uh, the, if you see, these carry the uh, RF to ground uh, as, as, of course, the counter to the antenna, uh, which is up this way. And the center disc is, uh, both discs are metal, the outer disc is grounded. The center disc it is held off the lower one by a, a hundredth of an inch thick sheet of mica. And uh, it's actually that the disc of mic is slightly smaller than the small disc in the center. So uh, when you go to transmit, a hundredth of an inch doesn't keep uh, uh, the RF back at all. So it just arcs across and you have a good clean ground to uh, ground for the uh, transmit antenna. But when you lift the key, um, the gap reforms and of course it's many mega ohms and now this can go to the receiver. So this is the TR switch. And in fact, it's, it's perfect QSK. There's, um, what, I, Helen? You, you can probably click on those. You see the minus? Uh, hang on, minus. sorry. No, yeah, the presentation you're making for us is visually perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. I just, I'm trying to remember what's under all the pictures. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, anyway, you see there's two other boxes that look like the jigger over here. These were just, um, loading coils. And I think they use both loading coils for 600 meters and only one loading coil for the, the 325. And, and you can just see there's little wires. They could move. There's terminals on the end. And of course, they're all varnished wooden boxes and you just move it to, to get. And that's the sort of thing that would have worked out. But that big antenna um, apparently was resonant uh, very close to uh, uh, 300 uh, uh, meters. And so the loading coils are for the, uh, the 600 meters, which they uh, always use. Another thing here, we'll get to this in a minute, but this, this is another useful thing. Down here, you can actually see, here's the key, and here they're showing the magnetic keyer. And uh, this here <clears throat> is that second coil to make the primary circuit out of the alternator resonant, which made, the, it raised the voltage and, and made it a very clean sine wave, which led to um, a much cleaner signal than most of these old radios put out. Okay, this is just a picture of what these parts look like. This, is, this isn't on the Titanic. This is just, I don't know, in a Marconi warehouse somewhere. It came out of an old book called Wireless. And here's what the transformer looked like. You put in a big steel tub. This is the 300 volt to 14,000 volt transformer. Here's the RF chokes. Here's the MG set. And you can see the disc discharger kind of gleaming there. And here's the tank circuit with a spiral inductor and the uh, banks of condensers. Now, one thing which I kind of wondered about when I first saw the schematic is, how do they tune this thing up? Because you need, there certainly was no uh, power SWR meters in those days. And um, if you know World War II equipment, they all used RF current meters, which is a fine way to do it. If you just measure the antenna current and turn all the adjustments on your radio till you get maximum RF current in your antenna, 
as you know, that your, your signal strength is directly proportional to your RF current. So what they came up with, and there's no meters for it, but it's just a, a little bulb, flashlight size bulb, and a shunt over here. So this would be between uh, transmitter and ground. So one would go to the transmitter side, the other would go to ship's ground. And this was just a shunt. So you'd set it so that maximum current out of the radio would give you full brightness without burning out the bulb. And so you just tune everything to get the greatest brightness in the bulb and you're, you're spot on. So dead simple, but uh, it worked just fine. And here's a photograph from the Olympic. As you'll see in a minute, there's only one existing photograph of uh, the radio room in the Titanic and it's pretty poor. But here actually is, there's the earth arrester and here's uh, the, the RF uh, measuring uh, device. Here's, now here's the, uh, it's called the Marconi multi-tuner or multiple tuner. And uh, just after 1900, Marconi was demonstrating his uh, radio of that time at a yacht race in England. And uh, uh, there was no tuning in it. And so uh, it, uh, if you couldn't have two radios in the same area because they would uh, uh, basically QRM each other to the point where you couldn't hear anything. And so uh, a competitor of Marconi's mocked him in the London Times and he didn't like that. So he went out and he got the most promising young RF engineer he could find. And this engineer designed this thing. And it's, it's a famous patent of, patent of four sevens, they called it. And he came up with this in 1907 and it was widely used on ships and, and on land from 1907 to about 1918. And the guy's name was C.S. Franklin and uh, what it is, is uh, it's an antenna matching at the beginning and also a tiny spark gap in here to protect all the coils inside. And you could turn this screw down until the signal went away and then you just back it off and up so the signal reappeared and you had a very, very fine gap in there which would protect this device and the, the detector which came after it. These are, uh, these are the air variable capacitors. They're, in the, they're shielded in these, these cans and Here's the case from the bottom. As you can see, it's stuffed full of coils. And because you have no amplifiers, you have a, a, a difficult choice. If you use this maximum selectivity here, you get rid of most of your signal and you have no way to get it back. So this could be either quite selective or quite sensitive. And uh, well, as sensitive as, as your antenna allowed. So you had, you had to make a choice there. But uh, what it really meant was when another ship was close, you could crank in the selectivity and, and really get a, a better signal to noise ratio. But if it was a weak distance signal, you just had to put up with the noise. And I won't go through all the circuitry other than to say that you could set this up so that in the standby position, you just had one tuned circuit, uh, antenna matching, and the little micro spark gap, and you could get most of it through. Uh, if you had a strong signal, you could switch over to tune and you had about three different circuits and it tuned quite a range, uh, middle of 80 meters down to 120 kilohertz. And uh, these, this switch you see has four positions and in each of them, there's a different arrangement of all these capacitors and, and, and inductors inside to give you uh, so, something that would resonate through that, that range. And it, it actually was, was a very efficient device I was so interested, I, I looked around and wondered, I wonder if we could actually buy one of these if somebody's selling one. I actually did find one um, and it, it was in fair condition. And I asked what he wanted and he wanted 50,000 for it. And I thought, well, okay, I'll have to satisfy my curiosity in other ways. This is uh, the detector they use. Um, it's called the, the, the magnetic detector or the MAGI, the operators called it. And uh, you can actually see, if you look very closely, it's A for antenna, G for ground, and T, T for the telephones or the headphones. And you could literally use it like that, but you'd have no tuning. And I won't go through the details other than uh, they had silk coated, uh, stranded soft iron wire. And it, 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 this is full of clockwork. The two wheels brought the uh, iron wire through. It essentially worked very much like the wire recorder that was used in World War II and was the ancestor of the magnetic uh, tape uh, recorder. And there would be a small magnetism mag applied to this wire. And as a signal came through, in one direction, it would increase the magnetism and in the other direction, it would uh, 
decrease it, but uh, the, there was a remarked difference. The increase was readily detectable, but the decrease wasn't. So it was acting, this whole business was to get a decent diode and it worked very well. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, the ship had both the first vacuum tubes, uh, uh, the Fleming diodes, and this magnetic system, and, and the operators always preferred this, so the, the diodes never got used. I won't go through all the details here, but uh, it was actually invented by a very famous scientist, Ernest Rutherford, who was, uh, he was at the school I went to, McGill, uh, back in the uh, um, early 1900s. He went to, to uh, I think, uh, uh, Cambridge after that. Uh, this is what the, de the Fleming valve detector looked like, the two vacuum tubes and the day before vacuum tubes. Uh, these two sliders set the filament voltage, filament current, and the voltage between the plate and the filament. And it had its own little tuner built in, but uh, people weren't interested. Here's, here's what it really looked like. And everything had presets that you could uh, note down. You see all the calibrations on the capacitors. And actually, the original tubes in this one, this is a, uh, a recent, more recent picture, of course. Uh, these were old Army, U.S. Army tubes. Uh, they had a, what's called a BT series of tubes from the First World War through the Second World War. And this was one of the early ones. I guess they couldn't get the Fleming valves anymore, or these were better. Okay, this is just, I won't go through this again, but here's the uh, earth arrestor. And uh, in there, there's a hundredth of an inch gap, which allows it to arc over with any significant voltage but that this will be, uh, have a high resistance to ground when you're in receive. So this is how the system worked. Here's your transmitters over here. This is where your RF comes from. Antenna, um, the receive signal runs down to the coil and the jigger. Earth arrestor, uh, no transmit, goes into the receiver. Transmit, the earth arrestor shorted out and it goes to ground. Uh, now here's the key and uh, it's kind of an interesting key. I'm pretty sure that none of, you have this in your collection, although uh, I suggest if you see one on a flea market table for five or ten bucks, it's worth picking up. Uh, it's um, it's called a guillotine key. And can anybody out there tell me what a guillotine key is used for? Or what this lever on the side is used for? No, okay. It's um, in those days, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of spark transmitters ran very heavy currents through their uh, contacts. Here's, here's the main contacts in this particular Marconi key. Uh, and uh, they would often weld together. And if you left the thing key down, it wasn't like those alpha amps where you could leave a brick on the key for half an hour. Uh, you'd very quickly burn up your dis discharger and probably your alternator too. So uh, if you welded your keys, uh, contact then you just this the the second lever is in series so you just yank that up and uh, uh, the receiver goes or the transmitter goes back into receive and you don't burn up your radio now this had something else too you see there's some extra contacts over here and I'll show you in a minute what they're used for so this actually had when you keyed down here you close the contact here and you close the contact under here uh, now this is a bit of the original schematic, sorry, it's a bit rough, but uh, it's, well, it is what it is. And so here's, goes to the antenna, to the jigger in the antenna, here's your arrestor, here's your multi tune cross that, and your magnetic detector in here, your uh, wires out, and here's your headphones. And uh, you see two wires running to the key. So what happens, the minute you go to transmit, this both sets of contacts close, and you short together the two wires to the headphone. So it's true QSK. And when you depress the key to go into transmit, you short out the headphones so you don't get a blast of, of the arcing that's going on in here in your headphones. And the minute you lift the key up, you hear, you hear what's going on in the air. And, and the operators would use it in this way that if they wondered, is anybody calling me? Is there a problem? You might leave a, a few seconds between one message and the next or one sentence and the next and have a quick listen and then go back to your, your sending. So um, it, uh, anyway, it, it, I think once it was running, uh, it was a pretty convenient uh, system to use. Um, somebody asked, remember in the last time I gave this, is there any side tone? As I'm sure you know, and things like the railway, uh, CW, I shouldn't say CW, t telegraphy, uh, you just listen to the clicks. Well here, there's no intentional uh, side tone, 
but in the very next room to you is the disk discharge and the alternator spinning away at 6,300 RPM. And when you go key down, there's just a roar that comes in. So you don't have to worry about knowing when you're keying down. You hear the great roar and then that's it. They even had, and I kind of like this, it's full of little bits of cleverness. This here, if you notice, is something else that says key. And this isn't connected with the transmitting key. There's a dry cell battery and a little buzzer. And this was like the cheap buzzers some people would use for uh, uh, doorbells. It was connected to the tuner. And so you came in and let's say you wanted to check out the radio before you, you got on the air. You would depress this key and the buzz generated sparks and they went through the tuner, the detector and the headphones. So you just had to press that key and if you could hear it in the headphones, then this whole system was ready to go. If you couldn't hear it in the headphones, then you had a loose wire or some other difficulty in the system. So it was a, a slick little thing. And here's how the, they really used it on the Titanic. Here's your magnetic key relay, which is switching the heavy current. These LC lines are that primary 17 amps. So it's being switched here. And the, the main key that you put your finger on is just switching the, the solenoid, the coil in the, in the relay. And then the heavy current goes down here, runs across and back into the rest of the primary circuit. Now here's a picture on the uh, uh, Olympic. And the Olympic was made from, was constructed from the same blueprint that was used to construct the Titanic. And uh, when James Cameron was looking to make the Titanic movie, this was the picture he used to construct the movie set. And it was assumed that the Titanic was the same because they were made from the same blueprint. Although Cameron did know that this is a window because the radio room on the Olympic was on the port side and that was, there's a view out there. This must've been at night, uh, this picture was taken. Um, and in the Titanic, it was along the center line of the ship. It was in the middle of the top deck, the boat deck. Um, and um, so there was that difference. Now this is the only picture of the Titanic's radio room. And this is Harold Bride, the assistant operator's back. And it was a, a double exposure just to make things worse. Uh, uh, anyway, so he assumed from this that these items, that, that's the uh, power supply for the Fleming valves, the magnetic detector, the 10-inch emergency spark coil, the keys, uh, and so we're all the same. So surely the two ships had the same layout of their electrics. Now, you see here, all those controls for the transmitter were put in the center room, the Marconi room. The silent room or silent cabin is just the other side of this wall. And that was the one that was all lined with wood to keep, keep the uh, discharger racket down. But uh, so this is what they built. And here's, here's the movie set showing um, the, the, the actors and all the panels back here to control the transmitter in the uh, Marconi room, as they called it, or operator's room. And here's another. Uh, by the way, um, these things here, if you're wondering what these are, uh, I, I'm sure most of you have been in older stores where they had a pneumatic delivery system for bills and paper and so forth. Well, that's what they had on the Titanic, that if you wanted to send a message uh, as a passenger, you went to the chief purser down below on another deck and you filled out the forms, he, he filled them out, he put them in these little cylinders here and he popped them in and, and one sucked the uh, little uh, tube with a message and dropped it in the basket for the operator. And the other was the operator could send the, the little tubes back to the purser. So, uh, oh, here's just, just to give you a feel of, of where it is. This is the center line of the ship, the bow this way, the stern there. Here's a silent cabin with the uh, transmitter. Most of the transmitters in here, all the big stuff and the high voltage and the noise is in here. Marconi room and they had a little, a little bedroom with two bunks and that's, that was the operator's world. And this is about where the antenna feed through was to go up to those four great, uh, uh, two great twin T's on the roof. This is a, another CGI image uh, showing uh, what exactly was. This is the Alvin, which is a, a deep diving submersible from Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, on Cape Cod. And it's, it's right above the skylight in the Marconi room. So the, the Marconi room is great under this. The silent room would be here. And the bunk, bed, bunk room would be over there. And it, it was one of the 
several submersibles that took pictures of the uh, radio room. If you look closely, you'll see there's a little faint yellow umbilicus that goes down to a, a robot rover. And uh, this is how the pictures were taken. No human has been into the radio room or the silent room since uh, 1912, but a lot of little rovers have gone in to take pictures. Now here's when they took the first pictures in the silent room, not the Marconi room, the silent room, what did they see? They saw the whole panel to control the motor and the alternator and the disc discharger in the silent room. So it was wired up quite differently from the Olympic and camera had a movie set all wrong. Over here, you can actually see these are the big tubs with the capacitors and the high voltage standoffs for the called a switch commutator that they used to switch from uh, the, between the two bands. Here's a later picture taken. Uh, and here's, this is the, the voltmeter for the, the DC motor. I, you, can know, you can tell because it's on the, the left side of the panel there. And uh, here's an, uh, this guy, Park Stevenson, uh, collected all the pictures and the videos that had been taken in there. And he, he made a, lot, a number of nice CGI's. To, so this is his cleaned up version of the alternator and the disc uh, discharger. Uh, and here's, here's the reality here. It's interesting because he made one mistake that he shows this whole thing as if it's just wood. If you look real carefully at the original on the floor of the Atlantic, it's, uh, you can see, I think that's the lead layer there or could, could be the asbestos actually, but this was lined. So as I mentioned, you, you wouldn't burn up the box. And, uh, this, uh, it's covered with uh, loose sediment. And so one of the problems is they take a few pictures, but the little robot, of course, had propellers on the back so it could move around and position itself. And the propellers stirred up the muck and you couldn't take pictures. So they could just take a few pictures and then they had to stop because the, nothing was visible. And here's the, uh, this is the rheostat on the motor. And this is just where, uh, Phillips left it as he was running out the door and the water was washing into the room. So that was the, the final setting by the operators on the, the, the drive motor for the Titanic's transmitter. Uh, here's another shot in there of what we believe it looked like. Here's the, the spiral inductance and here's the jigger up here. And of course the motor alternator. And here's the way it looks. This is a recent one. And it's recent because you see this proposed recovery object um, legal permission has just been granted for a group to who call themselves Titanic Incorporated to go down and try to rescue what's left of the radio equipment. I'm kind of sorry they're doing it, uh, you know, because it, it's a tomb for 1,500 people. And two, because it's been so long that uh, the breakdown of, of the metal here isn't just rust. It, it's full of microorganisms that are digesting the iron. So a lot of this stuff, even the motor and the alternator, they may just crumble when they try to pick them up. So they may get nothing but a handful of bacteria. There's a spiral inductance, which has fallen off the wall. You can see the green corrosion on uh, those heavy copper windings. But uh, anyway, whether I like it or not, uh, they're going to go down and they want to put something in. There's already a, a good sized chunk of the uh, uh, Titanic's hull in Las Vegas. And they want to add this radio to it. I have to say, I would much rather see them build uh, an accurate working replica of the radio. But anyway, I wasn't asked. Here's a CGI of what the silent room, uh, they believe, we believe, looks like. Here's a huge battery for that backup uh, plain spark transmitter. Here's the high voltage transformer, caps and Swiss commutator. Uh, anyway, you can see the whole thing here. And so the antenna would have come out about here from it. Uh, they knew there was duck boards from descriptions there. And this was probably to keep your feet off the um, metal floor. Uh, I don't know if it would help much if you got across that 14 kilovolts. But uh, also, it's um, it almost certainly teak because teak is the one would, that doesn't get slippery when it's got salt water on it. And these would be just buckets of sand. You wouldn't want to, if there was a short circuit here somewhere, you wouldn't want to throw water on it. Um, this is uh, a picture that was taken from the uh, uh, silent room, silent cabin, and it's not an inductor. What it is, is um, the, uh, because the submersibles usually park over the, the uh, skylight in the Marconi room, they could look down through and they could see that, um, that it's gone, that the floor rusted out 
and most of the desk and its contents, all the radios and so forth, went sailing down below. Uh, they would have actually sailed down through the, the grand staircase, which was just below. If you've seen the movie, it's, uh, anyway, the grand staircase features in it. These were, they, they mounted the whole desk with all the receivers and the keys on it on four great coil springs. So this was under one, one of the feet of the desk and probably one to protect the delicate radios and probably two, maybe the send of Morris might be a little bit better without the vibration of the motors. Here are the operators. Jack Phillips was the senior. Uh, he was only 25 and people sometimes portray him as being young and inexperienced, but he started working for the, the government post office in, in England as a telegrapher on the railway when he was 15. So he's, he's been sending CW for 10 years. Um, after about four years uh, working on the railroad, he joins Marconi. And so he's been six years on a, a quite a long string of ships uh, in all parts of the world as the radio operator. Harold Bride's been working for Marconi for about three years. And so he's, he's the, the assistant. He's learning from, from Jack. So uh, how did the radio system perform? How effective was it? And as I say, they guaranteed a 250 mile range. Uh, the first night out, the, he, they tried uh, for longer distance and they got Tenerife in the Grand Canary, 1900 miles away. And they got Port Said, 2600 miles away. And it's interesting to consider that when you, they were receiving their, what they hear in the earphones is entirely energy, which was released by those transmitters that were 2,600 and 1,900 miles away. That is, there's no amplifier. When we listen to a radio today, we're listening to power that came out of our battery or our house current, but they were listening to power that came from the transmitting station thousands of miles away. And as they went down the coast of England, the first stop at Southampton, then go across to Cherbourg, uh, they found that they could work easily work anything within 400 miles. So they were, the, the radio was pretty effective, really. And as they headed across, now Marconi uh, made a lot of money off these, these things. And the way they made the money was not selling the transmitter, although I think they might have leased it. But by uh, you, anybody, could, anybody on board could send messages. They were quite expensive, but you could send a message. And so people uh, in the trip to where the ship sank, um, they sent over 250 messages, trivial messages, uh, they called them, from um, passengers back to England and then finally forward to North America. And so they were very busy. And so they delivered hundreds of messages. This thing works perfectly. Um, they also would contact any ship that they were near. And so uh, what happened, everything went fine till the 13th of April, the day before they struck the berg. And uh, it stopped working. And uh, the voltages were all wrong on the alternator and so forth. Long story short, uh, the two of them were up, they were working all day and then they were up all night finding the problem. And the problem was a short circuit inside that big can that the, the high voltage transformer was in. And there was a, uh, one of the rubber wires on the secondary on the 14 kilovolts had shorted to the case, but it took them a long time to find it. And so on the 14th, they were really tired and um, uh, actually Bride went to sleep. Uh, Phillips took the shift during the day. And uh, so he had had almost no sleep in about 24 hours when they struck the berg. Uh, oh, and also after they struck, um, they uh, of course sent out CQD and, and some of the legend is, oh, they sent the first SOSs. Well, they didn't. A number of ships sent SOS before they did, but they, they sent them for the first time. As a matter of fact, at first, they thought it was kind of a joke because when they struck the iceberg, there was almost no jolt. And so they started going back and forth, say, well, you better send the SOS. It might be your last chance. Ha, ha, ha. And so they did. They, uh, uh, Phillips sent SOS mixed in with CQD. And uh, it was copied by at least 28 stations, uh, uh, ships and shore stations and so forth. Um, so the radio, actually, the radio worked beautifully other than this one failure. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of the uh, timetable is kind of interesting, I think. So at 11.50 p.m., very end of the day, the Titanic lookout spotted this iceberg dead ahead. And they were uh, up about 
75 feet off the deck and a little uh, crow's nest on that huge uh, 190 foot front mast. So they were in a perfect location. They had uh, binoculars and they had a phone right there, fortunately. Anyway, so they immediately shouted down to the bridge, uh, Berg's uh, uh, dead ahead. And so the, the, the bridge immediately put the uh, wheel over hard to port. They uh, reversed the engines and, uh, but uh, a nearly thousand foot long, 50,000 ton ship uh, doesn't stop that quickly. Uh, and they know that they struck the Berg at 1057. So the, they had 37 seconds to deal with the iceberg in front of them. And it works out that uh, they're going 22 and a half knots, uh, which they shouldn't have been. And that's 500 yards. So they didn't see the bird till it was 500 yards away, but it was a, a moonless night and there was, there was no light out front. So they were lucky to have seen it even that soon. Uh, at 1058, Captain Smith shows up in the radio room. He says, uh, be ready to send an emergency message. I'm going to go inspect the ship. He's back at 1214. He says, send the emergency message, which was CQD, CQD, D-E-M-G-Y, given the latitude and it was sent six times. And then after that, there was many responses from ships and shore and extensive uh, back and forth. Finally, the Carpathia, uh, the Titanic knew that she was quite close and they kept trying to get her and they couldn't because she was sending a long string of messages to Cape Cod, actually, Syasconset Station. And uh, Titanic, <laughs> so, so Carpathia calls Titanic not knowing there's any problem, she says, oh, Cape Cod has messages for you. <laughs> of course, Titanic come back and didn't say screw the messages, but that's probably what he thought. Uh, he says, come at once, we have struck Berg. And uh, then he sends, this is he sends out to the Olympic, their sister ship was traveling in the opposite direction and had passed them earlier in the day, but by now was quite a long distance back towards England. But he, he called anyway, uh, MKC, MKC, and he used SOSs in calling the, uh, his the sister ship Olympic. And the last signal was heard. Now they struck at just before midnight and the Titanic sank at, some people put two, uh, 224 or 220, but so it was a, a float for almost two and a half hours after having struck the, uh, the iceberg. Okay, and in that time, they uh, contacted uh, 24 ships and four coast stations. So the radio was working great. Uh, there's now, there's a couple of if onlys here, which are kind of heartbreakers. I mean, we don't, you can't rewrite history and we don't know what would have happened, but uh, there was a problem and that was that one, that Phillips, the experienced operator was very, very tired and he had a huge backlog of messages to send. And so he was busy and these were the trivial messages, but it was his job to send them. So he sent them. And another problem was they didn't have proper communication. There was no communications between the, uh, uh, what you call it, the, uh, the captain's cabin or the bridge. So um, uh, Bride spent a lot of that time running back and forth, telling the captain what was happening uh, with the Carpathia and so forth. Anyway, a ship called the Masaba sent a message called stop, sea packed with ice. And the captain knew they were traveling very quickly because he'd been sort of persuaded to by the owner of the Titanic, Bruce Ismay, who was on board. He said, you know, Captain Smith said, well, we're on time. We're going to get to New York exactly when we plan to. But the, the owner said, well, you know, it would make a bigger splash if we got there a day sooner. So Smith was going to go slowly at night, but Ismay, I think the maximum speed was 24 knots and, and Ismay made him put it up to 22 and a half. Although obviously the captain has the last word, but anyway, no one will know exactly what was in the conversation, but they went at a uh, very high speed. And uh, the problem with this was, so if the captain had gotten this, then uh, history could well be different, probably would have been different. But when you sent a message in, in the Marconi system, uh, if it was to go to the captain and if it was important, you put MSG uh, message. And if an MSG came through, then it was the job of the Marconi people to get it to the captain as fast as they could. But he put, I, the guy in Masaba, the op in Masaba put ICE report. And that was a lower priority. So it went under uh, uh, Jack Phillips' left elbow while he worked the key and sent the other messages with his right hand. And it never got seen by the captain. And later on, uh, the Californian 
was in fact, at the time uh, that the Berg was struck, it was 11 miles from the Titanic. They, they, the, the ships could actually see each other. And so um, uh, Evans sees the Titanic still moving in, towards the ice. And so he sends SOM, we're stopped and surrounded by ice. And SOM is say old man. And this is what you use when you're talking to the other operator. It's not supposed to be for the passengers or the crew. It's for talking to the other operator. And so again, that went under Philip's elbow. And he sent, he heard it, like how could he not hear 11 miles away? And there was no automatic gain control. So it probably lifted the headphones from his head. Uh, he said, dotted it, dotted it, dotted it, dotted it, which meant I'm the faster ship. And in the Marconi system, the faster ship always had priority in sending messages because the faster ship wasn't as at sea as long and therefore it didn't have as much time to send messages and make money for the Marconi company. So, uh, and he said, I am working Cape Rays. In the newspapers after, this translated into Philip saying, shut up to Cyril Evans on the California. But no, this, this was standard operating procedure. There was no, no rudeness involved. But again, stopped and surrounded by ice, never got to the captain. It went under his left elbow. And uh, what was really ironic was now Evans, and this is another thing, one of the things that came out of this, of course, was that one operator wasn't enough. There was only one operator on the Californian uh, and also one, only one on the, uh, the ship that rescued them. Anyway, Evans had been on since 7 a.m. and this was midnight. So he said, I'm bagged out. I've been working for 16, 17 hours. So he went to bed and there was nobody on the uh, Californian listening to the radio. And uh, he went to bed at 11.35. The iceberg was struck by the Titanic at 11.50, 37 seconds. And uh, so at 12.15, after the captain does his recce, Phillips on the Titanic begins sending CQD. It's heard by many distant stations. Now, the third officer on the Californian was, he was just a third officer, it wasn't a radio operator, but he was fascinated by radio. And he used to go down when he was off duty and watch uh, Evans operating. So he was, he wandered down and uh, he thought he, they could see the Titanic. They could actually see the lights 11 miles away. And, and uh, then the Titanic started sending up rockets. And so uh, they got the captain up, but he said, oh, they're, they're just a passenger ship and they're having a party over there or something. Uh, so nothing was done, but Groves goes down and he sits in the operator's seat, the, uh, uh, Evan's seat, and uh, he puts headphones on. Now remember, this is a receiver that's never off. You just put the headphones on and you hear what's going on, except you have to start the Maggie, the magnetic detector. That little iron wire has to be running or it doesn't work. And the box was full of clockwork, but, and, and at one end, there's a key, you wind it up just like a grandfather clock. And the other end, there's a, a little rod that you pull out and you pull it out and that unlocks the clockwork and your wire starts to turn and, and the thing starts to detect. Anyway, Groves didn't know that. He didn't know how to start the Maggie. So he poked and prodded for a while and couldn't get anything and, and he, he left. And this was at uh, 12, 20 AM and at that time, uh, Phillips over on the, the ship was constantly sending CQD. So if he figured out how to start the Maggie, he would have heard that. And even if he didn't, I don't know how much Morse Cody knew, but even if he didn't, uh, it was a loud, persistent, long signal. And I suspect he would have gone in and, and awakened Evans. And that would have given them two hours before the, the ship sank to, to get to the Titanic and history would be very different. So uh, Captain Lord, uh, I don't know, didn't uh, didn't pay attention, and uh, he said, "Nah, they're just having a party." And he went back to bed. And so the they never moved. Okay, and and so uh, the last part, which was kind of sad, was that uh, Phillips was at the key, and uh, he about. Uh, 10 minutes before the Titanic sank, the captain came by and said, uh, you've more than done your job, time to save your own life, you're, you're released. But Phillips wouldn't leave and he, he kept sending and kept sending and he sent Bride off. And uh, uh, Bride, uh, anyway, Phillips kept sending till literally water was coming in. And at that point, 
if you look at the knife switch in that underwater image, the knife switch that shut off the motor, which shut the whole transmitter off, had been pulled down. So even though there was no chance in a million that that radio would ever be used again, uh, Phillips training sort of told him to turn it off and he did before he ran out the door. And uh, anyway, this is what was called collapsible B. This, uh, some of the lifeboats were hardwood as you would expect them to be. Some had a wooden keel, but a canvas side that sort of popped up that you could stack these things. So more fit in the same place. Anyway, this is collapsible A, which behaved as it should and took people off. You notice it's not full. And that was a sad thing that most of the lifeboats weren't full. Anyway, this one was upside down. Uh, Bride got to it and a whole bunch of guys were trying to push it off. It was on, they were on the boat deck. The radio room was on the boat deck, which is the very top deck of the ship. And these boats were all up there. So it wasn't far to go, but he got there and it was still upside down and, and the people that were there couldn't turn it over. And this problem was solved because that end of the boat deck just slipped under the water and a big wave came in and washed it out like this. And uh, Bride was holding onto an oar lock and he ended up inside the boat, but the boat was upside down and he, he finally got out before he drowned. And, uh, was floating around in the water for some time and uh, the water was about one or two degrees centigrade so uh, you can't last very long in that. Anyway he became sort of uh, he hallucinated became very dozy and the only reason he survived was that uh, he was actually quite close to this and one of the people aboard hauled him on and he, he lay across the back of the boat. Uh, four hours later the Carpathia shows up pulls him all aboard as he's getting off and he got his legs or his feet badly injured because somebody was sitting on his feet and he didn't even notice he was so hypothermic. As he got off, he, he saw Phillips was across the front of the boat, but Phillips was dead from exposure. And so he, he survived and uh, Phillips didn't. So these, just, just to give you an idea, these are the guys that I've just been talking about. Here's Groves, the non-operator who, if he'd figured out which lever to pull in the Maggie, might have changed history. Here's Evans, um, the guy who uh, was asleep when uh, he was needed, but can't blame him. He'd been working for 17 hours. Uh, and uh, here's uh, Howard Cottom, who was the operator in the Marconi. And actually what happened was he was on for over 30 hours and uh, uh, Bride was down in the little hospital on the ship, uh, getting back to normal temperature and uh, he was awakened because they said, the radio operator's uh, gone queer. I think, could you take over? So he actually spent what was left of the night uh, handling messages on the Carpathia. And so how did the radio affect the disaster? Well, uh, the 710 people who were saved by radio almost certainly would not have survived if it weren't for radio. And all the radios worked just fine. And the radio operators all performed basically well or heroically. And, uh, but 1,514 people died. And the, of course, there was boards of inquiry held by the United States and Britain right afterwards. And it really came out inadequate radio protocols and for excessive speed near the, uh, the iceberg. Uh, anyway, and this uh, it was interesting because uh, uh, and a separate activity, I'm sure you're all familiar with the International Telecommunications Union, it goes way, way back because they started regulating land telegraphy before radio came along, still going strong today. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, came up with a series of recommendations, which we all know very well. It was this which started the national call sign assignments. Like you, you might have a call like 2AX or, or 5TT, but there wasn't the initial letter um, and so at this, countries were assigned letters, you know, uh, W for the U.S., V for Canada, G for Britain, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they set up the weather station and time station frequencies. The Q codes came out of this. A variety of codes were used by different services before that. They weren't the first codes, but the Q codes that we know now, plus all the ones for message handling, which we don't use very much, uh, came out of this. The 24-hour radio watches, this, this became required for larger ships, which meant at least two operators. And pauses and longer messages for emergency traffic. And this clock, which <clears throat> for those of you that aren't familiar with it, 
this is the radio room clock, the radio room clock, and it was in use from 1912, uh, thanks to the Titanic, till uh, the end of, uh, of uh, 500 kilohertz being used, which I don't remember now if it's the late 90s, I think, early 2000s. And if you haven't read one before, what it means is the two red wedges are uh, obviously 15 to 18 minutes after the hour and 45 to 48 minutes after the hour. And these were the two periods when you were supposed to be listening to 500 kilohertz, 600 meters, the international marine distress frequency, and not transmitting anywhere near 600 uh, meters, 500 kilohertz. And uh, this is where, if you were in trouble, this is where you wanted to put your SOSs. And the arcs out here, this is, these are known as the auto alarm dashes. And uh, starting not too long after 1912, they devised a dedicated 500 kilohertz, 600 meter receiver that if you sent, uh, this was for a guide for the CW off that you'd leave a one second dash, a one second open uh, key up, four second dash key up, four second dash, four of those would trigger the mechanism. So nobody had to be listening. And this was the auto alarm. That in World War II, the heavy ship and the uh, search planes all had them. And when, when you did the four dashes, uh, you got bells ringing and lights flashing and uh, clearly there was uh, somebody in trouble. U.S., of course, passed the same act, and basically they said all the same things. <clears throat> Again, this is, this is the basis of, of uh, the way ham radio works today. That, um, all radio stations and operators must be licensed. Before this, if you were interested in radio, you just collected your Model T coil and whatnot, and you got on the air. Uh, all seagoing vessels, 24 hours, and, and it officially the distress frequency is 600 meters. The three-minute periods, and SOS was adapted. And also this famous line, which I'm sure you've all heard, that private stations, amateurs get 200 meters and down. That is all frequencies above 1.5 megahertz. And this was actually went through partly from a couple of sympathetic um, senators, and also because three hams who had the radio station at Harvard University in Boston went down and pled the cause, and apparently they were very articulate. So all of this, really is the upshot of the Titanic getting sunk. So in conclusion, you say, well, okay, what can we conclude? That really the radio regulations enacted because of the Titanic dis disaster have saved more lives than were lost on the Titanic. And, and uh, uh, anyway, 500 kilohertz has been used innumerable times, not anymore, of course, uh, but uh, it, it saved an awful lot of lives. Okay, I know that was a little bit long, but uh, I hope you got something out of it, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Yeah, thank you. That was excellent. Yeah. Okay. Let me just get that down a little bit so I can see some. What do I do? There. Okay, I'm just. Okay. No, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, well, well thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I don't, I don't have the thing, so I can't. Oh. Yeah, we did have um, WW9H asked, what was the difference between CQD and SOS? Uh, it, it just, uh, CQD uh, it came with the dawn of radio. The, early on, of course, radio was really developed for ships. And of course, one of the most important things for radio on the ship was uh, to let people know you're in trouble. And so CQD came out, I don't, I don't know exactly where it came from, but it was at the very beginning. And uh, uh, actually different countries were using other things as well. And so uh, there was, I think at the previous ITU meeting, SOS had been suggested as the new universal uh, sign of distress. Uh, any, any other questions? Fred, that was, that was great. Really, really fascinating and wonderfully presented. We sure appreciate uh, you doing this for us. Boy, you sure have done your homework on this, man. <laughs> you know <laughs> well, this subject. Yeah. Well, you know, as I'm sure you appreciate, when you're retired, you, you get into things, you know, and this was just, I started and I just said, I want to know how this, this, this transmitter worked. And for something which is as obsolete as the dinosaur today, 
it it did its job pretty well. I've got a question for you. Uh, you talked about the sister ship to the Titanic, the Olympic. Ooh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize I, this is the first time I, I heard that there was a sister ship that was yeah. essentially very close to the Titanic. Whatever became of that? Um, it, 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 uh, at the time, uh, traffic in the Atlantic was very different back then, as I'm sure you appreciate. U.S. was supplying a lot of the food that Europe was consuming. So there's all kinds of produce going east and there was millions of um, immigrants going west. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So there was, at any given time, there was dozens of big ships in the Atlantic going back and forth. And so um, they had the ready market. They brought, you know, tens of thousands of immigrants over. So Olympic continued for not a lot of years. I think she may went for about 12 years, 13 years, something like that. And eventually, uh, I don't know, she got scrapped. I don't know any more details than that, but uh, she was reasonably successful. I'm, I'm sure the White Star Line made their money back with her, which they certainly didn't with the Titanic. Wasn't the Lusitania also a sister ship, or was that not one of three? No, that was that was earlier. Actually, um, Harold Bride, he'd been on three ships before he went on the Titanic. He, he'd been the radio operator on the Lusitania. The Lusitania, I forget, I think it was, wasn't it uh, torpedoed in the First World War? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, but it, no, uh, I mean, the White Star had a White Star line had a number of ships, but there were different models and so forth. But anyway, this. Yeah. It's interesting because today, of course, we have a few bigger ships, but, you know, 900 feet long, that's that's a big boat. There's I think there's now a cruise ship that's longer than that and some of the carriers, cargo carriers, but. And it was, uh, everything on it was, uh, as far as I could make it state of the art, that it had thousands of light bulbs and, and even stoves were electric and the pumps and the, anyway, every, everything was. And uh, it, uh, and in those days it had a top speed of 25, 26 knots and there wasn't anything that went faster than that. Incredible. The only thing they didn't electrify was getting the coal into the boilers. They had a big gang of stokers down there. There's actually a little, what I had, I'm not going to bore you with it unless you're really interested. I, I found just the other day a, uh, 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 an article that was on the front page of the New York Times on Friday the 19th of April, 1912. That's four days after the sinking. And what it is, is it's a ver verbatim interview with uh, Harold Bride, the uh, surviving uh, radio op. And it was held in the... Uh, uh, the following thrilling statement was dictated by Mr. Bride, the assistant Marconi operator on board the Titanic, to the New York Times representative in the presence of Mr. Marconi, who's now staying in New York. And uh, so it's in his words, but he has to say all this in the presence of his big boss, uh, who with a flick of his wrist could make him unemployed. Plus, um, Marconi, of course, wouldn't want any ill things to be said about the, the radio operations on the boat. But anyway, it's um, his words. He talks about exactly what happened. And I know one thing he leaves out, which he uh, admitted to a number of people afterwards that returning from one of his, uh, well, Phillips was at the key and he was running back and forth to Smith to tell him where the Carpathia was because they realized the Carpathia was the only ship that could help them. Uh, and uh, First, he, uh, Phillips wouldn't get up from the key, so he went and got Phillips' heavy coat and put that on because it was really cold out, and then he put his life jacket on so that when he left, he could just run out of the room and, and go and, and hopefully survive. Anyway, he came back, and there was a stoker there, from Titanic, obviously, uh, who was trying to, uh, Phillips was trying to send, and the stoker was trying to get his life preserver off because he didn't have one. And so, um, Bride picked up a big wrench and, and wailed the stoker on the head who went down on a welter of blood apparently. And that was the end of him. And that didn't end up in the New York Times. It was, it was told later on. But uh, um, Bride certainly had what would be called PTSD because uh, uh, after, uh, after, actually he spoke about it for a few weeks after then he didn't say anything for the rest of his life. He just said, oh, I don't remember anything. 
but you can imagine it was pretty traumatic for him to go through this and for anybody. Yeah. If, if, if you're interested, I can read this thing off. It's, it's, it's three pages, but it's just what he had to say about his experience. Are people interested or is that, I, I went a long time there. That's probably all. I'm time. okay with it. Okay, well, you Here's can. some interest. Yeah. Okay, I'll, if, you, if you're not interested, then you can, uh, of course, you can uh, switch off, but okay. Um, the following statement was dictated today by Mr. Bride, the assistant Marconi operator on board the Titanic to the New York Times representative in the presence of Mr. Marconi, who is now staying in New York. I joined the Titanic in Belfast. I was born in uh, Nunhead, London, 22 years ago and joined the Marconi staff last July. I first worked on Haver Haverford and then on the Lusitania and was transferred to the Titanic at Belfast. I didn't have much to do aboard the Titanic except to relieve Phillips, a senior operator from midnight until sometime in the morning when he finished sleeping. So it seems that Phillips, as a senior operator, handled most of the traffic and, and uh, he was there to make sure that the thing was manned uh, 24 hours a day. There were three rooms, the wireless cabin, uh, one of the sleeping room, one a dining dynamo room, and one an operating room. Uh, I went to sleep uh, in the bed, then I was conscious of waking, and this is on the 14th when, when they struck, waking and hearing Philip sending to Cape Race. I read what he was sending. It was only routine matter. I remember how tired he was and got out of bed without my clothes on to relieve him. I didn't even feel the shock. When he says, I didn't even feel the shock, that was the moment when the Titanic hit the iceberg. And most people didn't feel anything at all because it was like, I don't know, it was like getting your throat slit with a razor. It, was, it wasn't a big impact because they almost missed the uh, iceberg. If, uh, ironically, if they'd hit it straight on, uh, the Titanic probably would have survived. The, the bow would have been wrecked, but they wouldn't have opened five compartments, which is what sank the, which what the, the slice down the side did to the Titanic. Uh, I hardly knew it had happened until after the captain had come to us. There was no jolt whatever. I was standing by Phillips telling him to go to bed when the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, the captain said, and I'm having an inspection made to tell what it has done for us. You had better get ready to send out a call for assistance, but don't send it until I tell you. The captain went away and in 10 minutes I should estimate he came back. We could hear some terrible confusion outside, but not the least thing about the ship to indicate any trouble. The wireless was working perfectly. Send that call for assistance, ordered the captain, barely putting his head in the door. What call should I send, Phillips asked. The regulation international call for help, just that, and the captain was gone. Phillips began to send CQD. He flashed away at it, and we joked while he did so. All of us made light of the disaster, we joked that way, while we flashed signals for about five minutes. Then the captain came back. What are you sending, he asked. CQD, Phillips replied. The humor of the situation appealed to me, and I cut in with a little remark that made us all laugh, including the captain. Send SOS, I said. It's the new call, and maybe your last chance to send it. Phillips with a laugh changed to SOS. The captain told us we'd been struck amidships, or just after midships. It was 10 minutes. Phillips told me after he noticed the iceberg, but the slight jolt was the only signal to us that the collision had occurred. We thought we were a good distance away. We said lots of funny things to each other for the next few minutes. We picked up the first steamship Frankfurt, gave her our position and said we had struck an iceberg and needed assistance. The Frankfurt operator went away to tell his captain. He came back. We told him we were sinking by the head and, he, and, and that we could observe a distinct list forward. The Carpathia answered our signal. And we told her our position and said we were sinking by the head. The operator went to tell a captain and five minutes returned and told us Carpathia was putting about and heading for us. Our captain had left us at this time and Phillips told me to run and tell him what the Carpathia had answered. I did so, went through an awful mass of people to get to his cabin. The decks were filled with scrambling men and women. I came back and heard Phillips giving the Carpathia further directions. Phillips told me to put on my clothes. Until that moment, I forgot I wasn't dressed. I went to my cabin, dressed, I brought an overcoat to Phillips, and as it was very cold, I slipped the overcoat upon him while he worked. Every few minutes, Phillips would send me to the captain with little messages. They were merely telling how the Carpathia was coming our way and giving her speed. I noticed as I came back from one trip, they were putting off the women and children in lifeboats, and the list forward was increasing. 
Bilbs told me the wireless was growing weaker. The captain came and told us our engine rooms were taking water and the dynamos might not last much longer. We sent that word to the Carpathia. I went out on deck and looked around. The water was pretty close to the boat deck. There was a great scramble aft and how poor Phillips worked through it, I don't know. He was still working at the key, but anyway. He was a brave man. I learned to love him that night. I suddenly felt for him a great reverence to see him standing there, sticking to his work where every, every, everybody else was raging about. I will never live to forget the work Phillips did for that last awful 15 minutes. Phillips clung on, sending and sending. He clung on for about 10 minutes or maybe 15 after the captain released him. The captain said, you can go now, you've, you've done everything you can. And he just, he kept on going. The water was then coming into our cabin. From aft came the tunes of the ship's band playing the ragtime tune Autumn. Phillips ran aft and that was the last I ever saw of him alive. I went to the place where I'd seen the collapsible boat on the boat deck and to my surprise, I saw the boat and the men still trying to push it off. I guess there wasn't a sailor in the crowd. They couldn't do it. I went up to them and was just lending a hand when a large wave came awash the deck. The big wave carried the boat off. I had hold of an oar lock and I went off with it. The next I knew I was in the boat, but that wasn't all. I was in the boat and the boat was upside down and I was under it. I remember realizing I was wet through and whatever happened, I must breathe for I was underwater. I knew I had to fight it and I did. How I get out from under the boat, I don't know, but I felt a breath of air at last. There were men all around me, hundreds of them. The sea was dotted with them, all depending on their life belts. Hmm. I felt I simply had to get away from the ship. She was a beautiful sight then. Smoke and sparks were rushing out her funnels. There must have been an explosion, but we heard none. We only saw a big stream of sparks. The ship was gradually turning on her nose, just like a duck does that goes down for a dive. I had only one thing in my mind, to get away from the suction. The band was still playing. I guess all the band went down, they were heroes. They were still playing Autumn. Then I swam with all my might. I suppose I was 150 feet away with a Titanic on her nose with her after quarter sticking straight up in the air began to settle slowly. When the last waves washed over her rudder, there wasn't the least bit of suction I could feel. She must have kept going down just as flowing as she had been. I felt after a little, while like sinking, I was very cold. I saw a boat of some kind near me and put all my strength into an effort to swim to it. It was hard work and I was all alone when a hand reached out from the boat and pulled me aboard. It was our same collapsible boat and the same crowd was on it. There was just room for me to roll on the edge. I lay there not caring what happened. Somebody sat on my legs. They were wedged in between the slats and were being wrenched. I hadn't the heart to ask the man to move. It was a terrible sight all around, men swimming and sinking everywhere. I saw some lights off in the distance and knew a steamship was coming to our aid. I didn't care what happened. I just lay and gasped when I could and felt the pain in my feet. I feel it still. Well, this was four days after that he's saying this. At last, the Carpathia was alongside and the people were being taken up a rope ladder. Our boat drew near and one by one, the men were taken off it. One man was dead. I passed him and went up the ladder, although my feet pained me terribly. The dead man was Phillips. He died on the raft from exposure and cold. I guess he had been, uh, I guess he had been all in from the work before the wreck came. He stood his ground uh, and had been uh, until the crisis passed and then collapsed. But I hardly thought of that then. I didn't think about anything. I tried the rope ladder, my feet pained me terribly, but I got to the top, felt hands reaching out to me Next, I know a woman was leaning over me in a cabin and I felt her hand, her hand waving in my hair and rubbing my face. I felt somebody at my feet and felt the warmth of liquor. Somebody got me under their arms and I was carried down below to the hospital. That was early in the day. I guess I lay in the hospital till near night when they told me that the Carpathia's wireless man was acting queer and would I help. After that, I was never out of the wireless room, so I don't know what happened to the other passengers. Hmm. So, so he left out, uh, probably because Marconi told him to, or he didn't mention it, the business about uh, clobbering the, the uh, stoker. Yeah. Anyway, that's hard to imagine what that would have been like, but you can see why you might get PTSD out of that. Really?
Well, thanks, Fred. That was a great, great presentation. We really appreciate it. Sorry it ran kind of late, but... Uh, no, no, no. It was, uh, it was wonderful. It's okay. It was very interesting, though. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you're very welcome. Anybody else have anything else? Yes. A big thank you to him for his work. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, I get these little projects. I'm retired, so I get some time. And I get things start to interest me like this, and so I get into it. And, and I never really understood how that transmitter worked before, and now I do. So that was good. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. You're very welcome. And of course, we've been trapped in the house since March, so. Yeah. <laughs> My wife's been busy playing solitaire over here. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate these Zoom meetings. It's, uh, you know, the only social interaction we get. Uh, oh, I know. Yeah. Same thing here. Yeah, yeah it's, well, it's frustrating. We, we travel when we can, but of course, uh, and we were very lucky because we took a very nice trip at the end of January, beginning of February, but that was it. Now we're, we've been here ever since. Sure. And our kids are, one's in Alaska yeah. and one's in Great Britain. Yeah, so. we were gonna go hiking with our daughter in England uh, about now, but uh, it's not gonna happen. Anyway, everybody's going through it. Yeah.